We've got a ton to celebrate in the diabetes awareness space today. Now, that aside, this week is my daughter Brooklyn's first birthday. So that is just crazy exciting. We got some celebrations for that. But in addition to that, the day that I'm recording this today is World Diabetes Day. This month is National Diabetes Awareness Month. And in addition to that, we decided to break a record for the first time in almost two years. We're bringing a guest on the podcast, somebody really special that we had an incredible conversation about diabetes awareness, advocacy, what it's like to live and thrive with diabetes, and ultimately to deliver a message of hope and inspiration that diabetes does not have to hold you back. Even though sometimes it can get frustrating, you can still accomplish your dreams and drive yourself forward. So today we are bringing you an interview with Derek Feller. And if you have not heard of this guy, you're living under a rock. He's all over Netflix and uh, the big screen, just really an incredible advocate for diabetes in the Hollywood industry. So today I want to share that story with you. So without any further ado, we're going to hop into our theme song and then jump straight into the interview. I hope you enjoy it. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandevecht, head coach and co-founder of FTF Warrior, and welcome to Part of My Pancreas. All right. Well, Derek, I am so excited to have you on the Pardon My Pancreas podcast and uh, and dive into your life a bit. I've seen you on the big screen and uh, my wife actually is the one who introduced me to your world and was like, he has diabetes. And so I uh, decided to jump in and I'm so grateful to have a chance to chat with you. So thanks for joining us today. You are so welcome, Matt. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy for all that you do for the type one community. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get the chance to actually talk to you here. Oh man, I'm stoked about the conversation I had too. I know we got uh, a bunch of fun topics to cover, but uh, obviously first thing that we have in common being type 1 diabetes, can you tell us a little bit about where that started? How old were you? What was it like uh, living? Yeah. Well, my diagnosis story is, is hard to remember for me because I was three years old. So um, I've had that type 1 diabetes for over 30 years now. So my life's a little bit different than a lot of those other people who are diagnosed a little bit later in life because I don't remember life without it. So mm -hmm. the main thing that's really changed for me in my diabetes story is uh, the technology and the ways that you treat it. That, that's the, the main difference that I can remember going back because I didn't have that life before diabetes where, you know, when I was eating kids' birthday cake and, you know, eating, going out and trick-or-treating on Halloween and eating all the candy that just never really existed for me especially back in the day when we were you know in the late 80s early 90s um it was more stay away from these type of foods instead of take insulin for them and you know as, as today you can kind of you know cipher through that and eat whatever you want with uh, with the technology very true yeah and the management style the devices available I mean even in the last like five to 10 years have <laughs> been dramatically different. Uh, it's so wild. Yeah. So think back 30 years that, I mean, I was, I was peeing in a cup and dipping the stick in it to see if I, you know, if I was super high, I had to wait almost two minutes for a blood sample. Insulin wouldn't kick in for over like an hour, two hours. It was crazy. Holy cow. Did your parents tell you about what it was like since obviously you don't have the direct memories? Um, yeah, it was tough. I mean, I, I know type one diabetic parents out there, all of them alike, like there's a lot to deal with, but my parents were just incredible. I was so lucky to have them. I remember my, my parents would wake up at midnight every single night to test our blood while my sister and I were asleep because my sister's a type one diabetic as well. No way. I did not know that. So was my sister. Yeah. Well, one of the three, but I didn't know that either. Wow. wow. Huh. I, was your sister diagnosed right alongside you or was it? A, a she was diagnosed when she was three years old. She was the exact same age I was when I was diagnosed. She's two years younger than me. Oh, wow. Which That's is weird. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Is that your only sibling then? I've got a half brother who is not diabetic as well, but no other diabetes in the family at all that, that we know of. Oh, wow. Okay. So you and I are both the first one in the line and then our sister got it. <laughs> you know, I hear that a lot. Uh, I, I feel like um, people often talk about how genetic, you know, associated diabetes is. But most of the time when I talk to people, 
Um, they don't know where it came from. Their maybe they had a grandparent, possibly, but usually, rarely their parents. I feel right. Okay, so what was it like growing up with a sibling that had type one? Was that a bonding factor, or did you ignore it? Definitely. And, and the one thing I, I well, there's a couple, a lot of things I remember growing up with type one, but um, there weren't a lot of people talking openly about it. There, there wasn't someone in the limelight that you could look up to. It's like, oh, they're a diabetic. They're making it happen. An actor, an athlete, or whatever. I didn't have that. I felt like. So my sister and I really kind of bonded together going through that process because we didn't have diabetic friends when we were younger. We, you know, one of us would run out of insulin, have to plug into each other's pump, like those kind of scenarios <laughs> that you can oh, imagine. Wow. Um, so there was definitely a lot of bonding with that. But then I think as we got older, we started going to like diabetes camps and kind of building more of a community that way. But I do remember in my younger years and her young years, both of us being very embarrassed of diabetes and, and our technology and our devices. And um, that's one of my main goals now is to totally change that for, for those newly diagnosed people or people who are somewhat embarrassed of diabetes. So, but I definitely remember those feelings when I was younger, for sure. Well, that's a fantastic main goal now. Uh, is there something that you're actively doing to impact other people's lives with diabetes? Um. Well, when it comes to that, I mean, actively doing, I'm, I'm working with the JDRF. Uh, I do a lot of stuff with their foundation. I also work with Dexcom and work with them for about six years. And, and it's more about kind of wearing the device openly, taking photos with it and talking to anybody who has questions about it. Because, um, you know, I, I really uh, um, believe in, uh, in bringing awareness, but also being open about, about the technology that's saving our lives, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, and I know that uh, for a lot of people, even telling people they're wearing the devices, let alone showing it off, is like this huge embarrassment. Uh, I know that when I first started, I wore it for like a day, ripped it off, and was like, I don't want anybody asking questions. So, um, I mean, what was that like for you when you first started wearing insulin pump, a CGM? Was mm -hmm. that confidence right out of the gates, or did it take some time? It took some time for me. I think I got my first pump was like the Decitronic D-Tron. And that was like, it was early. It was, I think I was like 15. And so it was, you know, um, early 2000s. And that was actually the first moment I remember when I got the pump. I was, I was embarrassed about it. And I felt like I was, you know, Iron Man or a cyborg or whatever it was. But I do also remember being able to eat whatever I wanted at that point and them saying, you know, all you have to do is push a couple buttons on this pump and you can eat anything instead of having to like take the injections and, and you know, time it out in advance. And um, it was kind of a big moment for me, I felt. Wow. Yeah, that's got to be a big game changer. Like, I can eat whatever I want. Yeah. That I was, want you know, when I was four, 14 years old, my whole life up until then, like, I don't know, it was tough growing up because I lived I lived kind of out in the woods and really far away from my high school. And so when I was a kid, I, I, I wasn't often able to spend the night at my friend's house. I could, you know, couldn't have birthday cake. There was always something to go along with the diabetes thing. So the pump, I felt like gave me a lot of, um, you know, a lot of freedom. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So now this kind of opens up a new side of the conversation that I'm curious about almost comparing notes on. Uh, so I had my foot in the door in the, the Hollywood industry, got started with modeling. I'm not as cool as you are in that sense, but uh, you're way cooler than me, man. I don't know about that, but placement of the CGM was always on my mind. And I was like, okay, is it in the shot? Can I hide it in some capacity? Uh, lost a few jobs because of it. Like, oh, you can't have medical devices showing. So I'm curious about your experience with that as someone who is really just you're very involved, right? You're on yeah. TV, you've got movies, your commercials. Has that come up in conversations? You know, um, it used to be different. I, I definitely have had instances in the past where I'm trying to get a job or like some kind of a commercial modeling, whatever. I got to take my shirt off. And mm -hmm. the thing about um, being a diabetic in this business is they're never looking for diabetics unless they are, you know. Right. So if you have devices like that, it doesn't make sense because you're playing a character that doesn't. So mm -hmm. it's like you have to hide them. So I have a lot of experience, actually, um, finding the right place to put the CGM or the uh, or the, the insulin, you know, the, the tubing. And my favorite spot, I, even though, um, you know, at Dexcom, you're not supposed to as an adult, but I put it right below my belt line on my backside. And yeah. that's like my main spot for most of my sites, because um, that way it's kind of out of, you know, out of view for if I take my shirt off. But I actually did have, OK, when I was working on 68 Whiskey about a couple of years ago, I had I had a nude scene, right? Uh, um, a simulated sex scene. 
And we had to hide my Dexcom because they wanted a backside shot, you know. So it turned into this whole thing. I had to I had to take it off and change it. And we tried to, you know, just kind of move the camera around it a couple times. And it got really awkward, as you can imagine. I'm because, sure. you know, my, my booty is the center of the frame. And that's my normal spot. And we had to show the front, too. So I, I just had to pull it off, unfortunately. But um, that's one of those kind of stories, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Holy cow. I can imagine that would be a difficult shot to get. Has it ever... Ooh show yeah. like post-production like oh shoot they forgot to edit it oh, out for sure actually i think in the shot that i'm talking about for 68 whiskey you can see it if you look really close you can see my decks come on they, they just use the shot because it's the one they wanted but it's just like you know i'm the right below my belt line yeah which is hilarious but um no one i don't think really saw it but me okay. but you know it's, it's it's a lot and i've got another example actually i went uh i shot a film in south africa cape town south africa a shark movie oh and um it was phenomenal it was the time of my life and we did five full days in the water, in open water. And while I was there, this was um, like eight years ago, um, I had a pump failure because Ooh. the pump, you know, got too wet or for whatever reason, I was wearing wet clothes and it, it, it failed on me. And I had a moment where I had to teach myself how to give myself injections for the next couple of weeks while I was in a foreign country. I had to find a way to get insulin that wasn't the insulin I was used to and needles. And it was just, it was such a scary, chaotic experience that from then on, I'd vowed to always have a second way to treat my diabetes because I was sunk without the pump. And after that moment, I, I went back to the insulin pens and learned how to, you know, how to dose and, and treat myself with just the pens. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years because I didn't want to be trapped without my pump. And now I'm back on the pump. But, you know, stuff like that kind of happens. And as diabetics, we got to find responsible ways to deal with them. Otherwise, you can't finish the movie. You know what I mean? So it was a right. lot. It was a lot of pressure. Yeah. Where's Derek? Oh, he's in the hospital. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah, you got to figure it out. Wow. So and obviously in the industry you're in, there's a lot of travel, right? Different time zones and having to pack for different scenarios. Uh, has there been any kind of scary situations with diabetes? Do you feel like you've been prepared for the most part? What's of that course. Like? And that's another thing I, I like to preach is no matter how prepared you are as a diabetic, no matter how dialed in you are to your technology and your numbers and what you're eating, something's going to go wrong, no matter what, because it's it's 100, you know, it's it's 24 seven. So I definitely have some scary stories with traveling or meals that I've missed or getting dangerously low and, you know, having to come to talk to, a, to the health professional on set in order to, you know, be prepared for when the scene comes. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of stories like that. I'll tell you one really quick that happened to me um, this summer. I was working in, um, in New Orleans. First of all, New Orleans in the summer is not a place to shoot. It was way too hot. People <laughs> were just dropping from heat stroke everywhere. Oh, right? no. It was it was so hot. And uh, it was it was challenging because we were shooting the swamp. Anyway, um, I was having a pump issue. I think my, uh, for whatever re reason, I had an occlusion in my tubing, so I wasn't getting my insulin, right? So uh, we're, we're waiting for this shot. In, in, this, in this show, I'm working on leverage redemption. In this show, we're out in the swamp, and I'm a, I'm a dirty cop, and the scene comes, and I have to shoot a bunch of alligators with, like, guns and machine guns. And we've been waiting for this shot for two days because it has to be right at dusk at, like, the golden hour. Oh, sure. And so, of course... I've got my trusty Apple watch with my Dexcom on it. And I look down and I realize that I'm double arrows down. All the insulin that I thought didn't make it into my body is now affecting me like way later than I thought it would. Ooh. So I, I, I've taken basically double the insulin I need. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm right around 100 with double arrows down and I've got like eight units on board. It's bad news. Oh, no. So, so I'm, I, I had to run to the uh, medical professional and tell her, you know, I'm a diabetic. I gave myself too much insulin. I've got too much in my system. I got to be prepped for this scene that we're shooting in like 15 minutes. <laughs> what do we do? You know? So it's like, it starts, you know, start chugging a Coca-Cola, eating these like glucose tablets, trying to make sure that I came up and I wound up being way too low when the time came. And so I had to sit in the tent and all of, you know, the production, the hundred person crew were waiting on me. And that's all ultimately Time is money in this business. And my main job is to make sure that I'm prepared when the time comes for me to do my job. And so that was a moment that I felt really bad. I felt like I really let everyone down. But luckily, because I saw it quickly, um, it, I wound up only being about 15 minutes behind. And I came up quick enough to do the shot and do the scene and everything worked out. But it was very stressful, you know, because 
there's just so many people there trying to make everything happen in the right timing. And for me to be the diabetic on set who's messing it all up, that's kind of my worst nightmare. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, especially the whole crew, production, especially on set. Like Totally. We, we've, got, we've got stunt guys. We've got, like, oh. fake, we've got fake guns. We've got alligators in the water. It's like a whole <laughs> thing. And I need to sit down in the tent and just drink a chug a couple of Cokes. It's, it's not the scene that, you know, you, you want people to see for sure. Well, and outside looking in, too, you can only imagine they're looking at the guy that's supposed to be doing the work on camera and you're sitting down sipping a juice. Yeah. Just, yeah. Meanwhile, I'm, a, I'm like right. the big muscle of the scene, too. You know, <laughs> I'm like the big tough guy. He's got a fight who is, you know, in the tent with his umbrella, like drinking like a like a fruity <laughs> drink. It's it's not the look I was going for. Oh, man. It's the invisible illness that like, gets it for me where it's like you're in a bad spot, right? You don't feel good. Urgent low coming on. But from the mm-hmm. outside looking in, it's like, oh, he's just relaxing in the tent. What's going exactly. on? You know, exactly. So, so, you know, I was very embarrassed. And I, anyone who asked, I tried to openly kind of give him the synopsis. But still, it's, it's, it's not the look you want as a diabetic who's promoting, you know, being a good diabetic, for sure. <laughs> it's Absolutely. like it, things happen no matter what. Yeah. And do people know you as someone who has type 1? Is that pretty common knowledge? Or is it just the diabetes community that sees you in that light? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I try to be as open as possible. I definitely go up when I'm on set and working. I go up to the director first thing and say, I'm a type 1 diabetic, just so you know. Hopefully, there won't be any kind of issues. But if there is, it means that I need sugar. Because as, as you know, um, you know, we can handle ourselves when our blood sugar is high, you know, as far as our mind and getting my lines out right and all that. But if there's an issue, I definitely am going to need some sugar. So that's, it. that's something I always establish when I get there. But as far as like uh, other people knowing... Um, I, I, I need a lot of uh, diabetics in the wild. I love that. Come up to me and show me their devices and take pictures with, with me. I, I love that because it just means that we're building more of that, you know, community out there. Absolutely. That's yeah. so cool. And it, diabetics in the wild is like the instant best friends. And I was like, oh, my gosh, the CGM. I know what that is. Instantly. It's like you've never made a quicker friend than when you see a diabetic out there, right? Yeah, Absolutely. So on the note of like diabetes on set and managing, it sounds like you've still held on to using a pump. Is that right? Yeah, I, uh, I'm currently on the um, the Tandem T Slim. Okay. Who, that, you know, as you, I'm sure you know, works with the Dexcom, mm-hmm. and that has been a complete game changer for me, uh, especially because a lot of diabetics. I don't know about you, but um, the lows at night is something that is just was kind of constant for me, at least every other day, and kind of having to wake up in the middle of the night, eat half a bag of gummy bears, it just ruins your sleep. So mm-hmm. one thing I found with the T-Slim and it being it have kind of the, uh, the automatic cutoff once you get low, I've been able to sleep so much better. So that's, uh, that's been really beneficial for me. Well, what about you? What, what's your setup? What, what's your system? Same exact. Yeah, I got it right here at the tandem. <laughs> Great. Great. Yeah, Dim and Dexcom. I might be switching back to MDI briefly, just get a little break going on, but... Yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic seeing the direction these algorithms are going and how fancy it gets, and uh, a lot of people are getting help, you know, just from a system running in the background. Like, how cool! Most is definitely, that? yeah. And it's like if if anyone's out there watching your podcast that, who is diabetic and doesn't have a CGM, look mm-hmm. into it. It's something that has just totally changed the game and made living with diabetes so much easier, for sure. Absolutely, I would say CGM is the one tool I would never give up. Like, yeah, a pump I can live without, but yeah, it's a CGM yeah. game changer. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, it, I know there's a couple out there, but Dexcom is the one I work with. I, uh, I sought them out uh, several years ago because they were the best and, and I, I believed in their technology and they had all these plans for the future. And I was like, I want to be in business with you guys. And now, luckily, it's been six years and I've done some of their commercials and been a part of their campaigns. And I'm really proud to work with them for sure. That's awesome. Which uh, model did you start with? Um, I guess the, the G5, right? I, okay. I mean, is that, that was, that was the, what was there one before? I don't even remember. Yeah. They start with the G4 uh, uh-huh. and I got on the G5 as well, but nice. yeah, it's, it's been cool seeing the innovation there. Excited for the G7 to come out in the U S totally. at some point. It's going to be exciting. It so very cool. managing the diabetes then back to that. Um, you mentioned like people are aware of your diabetes. You, you're obviously a great advocate for the, the world of type one. Uh, are there any strategies that you fall on as like, this is what helps me to stay in a close enough range so that I'm present on set? Yeah. Um, 
strategies um you know what something i'm really working on it's 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 hilarious it's like i've had diabetes for over 30 years but the main problem i find with my highs is i'm forgetting the bolus for my meals and it's like the easiest dumbest thing i've got like post-it notes my my new wife is like trying to help me with it too but it's like i don't know somewhere somewhere in the last few years i had some weird disconnect where i, I just forget to always take insulin when i eat which is like the easiest diabetic thing, but I'm working actively on that to be better because that's mainly the main, the only reason that I, I've been getting high, you know, as recent. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, as far as being on set, one thing I mentioned is my watch, my Apple watch. I oh, always sure. um, recommend or at least ask if my wardrobe can have that as a part of it because being able to just do this and know where you're at instead of like pull something out of your pocket when you're on set and you've got long scenes or things happening, stunts, whatever, it's been so helpful for me. And I haven't had a no yet since I've had the Apple Watch Dexcom combo. So it's I, I've been able to constantly have that, which is very beneficial. Wow. Okay. So just no old westerns and you're good. <laughs> Gotta make sure totally. you have the yeah, I mean, yeah, if it's an, <laughs> maybe I can wear it like on my forearm under my clothes or something. I don't know, but I don't know what I would do without my watch, honestly. Yeah. So okay on the Hollywood side of things, what are some of your favorite works that you've been able to accomplish? Like I know my wife talked about watching you in baby daddy and she was like, this is such a great show. And uh, tell me yeah. about that, but what's that's a good question. Well, you know, I, um, when you, it's funny you ask that because the first thing I think about when you think, when you ask me what, what my, you know, my biggest successes are, I think of the ones I didn't get, you know? So it's like, uh, that's not what I should do to myself because I, I, I shot a Marvel pilot where I got to play a Marvel superhero that got canceled, which is super unfortunate. Oh, so man. that was like my big moment, right? As a type one diabetic, getting to play yeah. a superhero. Similar to Breck, Breck Basinger, right? Like she's playing Stargirl. She's also a friend. She's killing it. It's, it's such, it's so awesome for her. But that was kind of my big thing. You know, I, I, I got, I was going to play Mr. Immortal in the New Warriors. I was going to be a type one diabetic playing a superhero, a Marvel superhero on TV. It was like that, that was, that was my goal and it didn't work out. So that's unfortunate. Um, but one of my favorite jobs I've done by far is um, I worked on American gods and that was after baby daddy stuff. Um, but it was kind of more, I, I, I played Thor, like uh, the, you know, the God of thunder. My yeah. name was Donar in the show. And the whole show was, um, was, kind of a period piece in the 40s. So it was this really elaborate, beautiful show and Thor worked at this burlesque show and I'm like juggling all these girls I got to work with these Cirque du Soleil <laughs> dancers and they built my costume from scratch basically on my body. I got to hold the wow. hammer, like the whole thing was probably the highlight so far. And I got to work with uh, Ian McShane, played my father. I had a big fight scene with him on a giant green screen. Like it was just, it was the kind of thing I wanna do more of for sure. That sounds amazing. I, I yeah. can certainly appreciate the desire to do more of that, and uh, and also the the frustration at the Marvel pilot that didn't quite pan out. But that just means yeah. that the next one's going to be even better, right? You're going to get sure. to the next spot and play super. I mean, that's that's kind of you got to have a pretty tough skin to be in this business, that's for sure. But I, you know, that's how it is. But but the thing about the Thor costume too, when I uh, I'm doing these performances on stage, it's like these burlesque performances, basically. So I'm not wearing much. I'm wearing these like gold strips. So I had to find a way to hide my devices with that costume big time too, which was funny. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And with your past before you got into Hollywood, uh, I'm curious to know how you went from studying the you know exercise and nutrition and all of this into being an actor. Was it an accident? Was it a childhood dream come true? You know, a lot of people don't know this story, so you know, here we go. Um, but I, I got into um, um, sports medicine and nutrition because I wanted to learn more about diabetes. I wanted to learn more about me, my disease, my body in order to help others and get into endocrinology. That was the goal. That was always the goal. Um, played basketball my whole life. So basketball was kind of a, a big part of my life as well. So um, I was, I was, I didn't, play basketball at CSU, but I was friends with the team, kind of walked on to the summer league and then didn't do that. So basketball was a big focus in my life as well. So sports medicine was like, was, was the, the plan. And then my senior year of college, um, I took a trip to Los Angeles. I, it, it was a fun trip. It was for new years. And, um, it was, it was one semester before I graduated. Right. And I went to, uh, to Los Angeles with a couple of friends, crashed on a, a friend, a guy's couch. I didn't even know and wound up meeting a bunch of people in the business, uh, a couple of actors, a couple of producers, a director who said, you know, you've got to look, you ever think about being an actor or whatever. And um, 
The answer was kind of like, well, not really. It sounds fun. And then what happened was I, um, I met a girl named Lauren Conrad at the bar. And she was working on this show called The Hills. And it's a reality show. I didn't know that much about it. But I met her at the bar and she asked if I would be her New Year's Eve date. So that was the next, the following day. I've been in L.A. for less than 24 hours. And I go <laughs> on this date with this girl. Uh, and it turns out to be a reality TV show. So I show, I show up to the date and I'm signing these, these releases. I, I didn't even know what to expect. I didn't know what was coming. I wound up being on the show and going on the date with Lauren and being like her New Year's Eve kiss. And it was a whole fun experience for a guy from Colorado who'd never been on TV before. But then, um, you know, the show aired and a couple of weeks later and it was like, you know, maybe maybe I'm going to actually try this. I was in L.A. for less than 24 hours and wound up on a, like a national television show. <laughs> Let's go for it. You know, so um, I, I was lucky enough, though, because I felt like I gained a lot of responsibility for my life because of the diabetes. Like I was a very responsible person. I was a very responsible kid. And then. I went to college and uh, was responsible there, got my degree, worked really hard. And then once I got to L.A., I hit the ground running. I'm like, you know, I'm the oldest person. Everyone comes after the dream right out of high school. I went through college. You know, I've got this education, but how is it going to help me? So I took as many acting classes as I could. I met as many people as I could. I just kind of hit the ground running. I wasn't about the social aspect. I wasn't about partying, drinking. None of it was important to me because I wanted to start working on my career. And I was really lucky that um, I booked a few commercials and then booked Baby Daddy within about a year of landing in L.A. Holy cow. That yeah. is fast. So that show went 100 episodes, seven years of work. And, you know, here we are a few years after that, still looking for the next job. But happy I made this decision. That is fantastic. What a journey, too, from Colorado. Just drop in L.A. and see what's going on. Oh, hey, now I'm on TV. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of I mean, and you think my parents too. like nobody nobody's ever been to LA on my family side. No one, you know, knows much about television and film. My parents, my mom was like, you know, I go for it. If it's what you think you need to do, I just can't help you. We know nothing about this business. So it was, uh, it was kind of a shock for them, but um, you know, they were, they were supportive in the same, in the same way. Absolutely. And you mentioned uh, basketball was kind of a desire of yours. You played summer league or something. Uh, has that gotten in the way of, acting modeling I've, I've known that being tall is a bit tricky that's a good question um the basketball i mean i'm all i played a professional hockey player I played a professional football player i've never played basketball on camera ever so that's something i really want to get a ch chance to do but as far as uh, the height and the size thing yeah i mean it, it's an issue when my resume says that I'm three inches shorter than I am, you know, because <laughs> and, and then it's like you walk into the casting room and you got to duck your head to get into the door. It's like, a, yeah. there, you know, it's it's tough because in this business, in order to get started, normally you need uh, to book a couple of smaller supporting roles. And the thing is, when it comes to like the best friend of the of the big time Hollywood actor, he's always five foot five. So they're never right. going to pick some guy that's a foot taller than him to be the supporting role. So it's been challenging. I, I definitely have missed out on roles because of my size. But in the long run, I want that to be kind of something that sets me apart from everyone else because I, I am, you know, six foot seven, 240 pounds, which is pretty, pretty big for, uh, for the Hollywood actor. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm making it work. Yeah. Well, you're giving hope to the rest of the tall guys out there who are like, ah, oh, I can't do it. You know, well, how tall are you, by the way? Uh, six, six. So six, six, there, yeah, there you get it. Well. <laughs> and you get asked how tall you are every single day, don't you? Every single day. Yeah. yeah. How's the weather up there? Same. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Oh, I always say I'd give you a couple inches if I could. Right? Yeah. Not hit my head on the door. It'd be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I'm sure it's been beneficial though for the role. It's you know, playing Thor, or Mr. Immortal, like all these these hero roles. I think that's pretty awesome. So that's yeah. Maybe where the, the pros and cons come into play. But mm -hmm. wow, what a story coming from Colorado and just bouncing into the industry. Uh, so you had the degree, you were going for endocrinology. Do you have any desire of furthering that path uh, for fun, like for your own diabetes management? Um, good question. The answer probably should be yes. But, you know, I, I love my job. I love what I do. I, uh, I like to focus a lot of my energy into uh, preparing for roles, reading scripts or developing new projects. So as far as um, like more schooling in, in, in for nutritional stuff, um, it'd be beneficial, but I, I feel like I, I use my time working on other stuff recently, I guess. Yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, I watch your Instagram. I learned a lot from you. 
<laughs> I'm glad that's provided a little bit of uh, value. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you have tons of tips and tricks and knowledge from what you've learned in your degree. Um, mm -hmm. Even if it's not the, the main thing, I'm sure it served you well with diabetes management. Uh, were there any epiphanies that you had while going through school where you're like, oh, that makes sense for my diabetes? Or did you already know everything going into it? Oh, I definitely did not know everything. But also, man, it feels like it was a while ago now, my, all my nutrition classes and organic chemistry and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, I don't know. I mean, one thing that is to I've totally noticed um, and something that I learned as well is our bodies change a lot. And uh, the effectiveness of insulin has changed for me as well. So it, it's something that, um, that I think is important for diabetics to communicate with their endocrinologist, um, you know, and, and keep up those meetings so that they know what's going to work best for them. Because like I said, our bodies change, hormones change, you know, uh, the, the effectiveness of insulin changes. And that's something I've really noticed as I'm moving in through my 30s as well. Absolutely. Okay. And, and as you're, you're making your way through this new career path, uh, I'm sure people are curious, what does an average day for an actor look like? Is this you just yeah. filming and shooting and, you know, well, well, it depends. Start? I mean, it's the best job in the world as long as you have a job. Being on set is the best part of the job, for sure, because you're amongst filmmakers and creators and collaborators and everyone's there to create the best product possible. And it takes so many jobs to get it done. It's just fascinating and incredible to be on set. But um, a day in the life when you're not on set is normally trying to eat right, trying to get a sweat on, trying to get a workout in. And then it's like taking meetings and, and trying to push forward with the projects that you're developing. And it's, it's, it's really hard. Being an indie filmmaker, especially right now through COVID, is extremely challenging because the COVID protocol makes up at least a third of the budget when you're on a low budget. So it's tough. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges and problems that come with, uh, you know, making films or TV at all. It's, it's, it's surprising that it even gets done, but, um, back to the question on the day to day, I mean, every day is different for sure. It, it's a meeting with somebody new or it's playing a different character. It's, it's really exciting and fun. And it's kind of the lifestyle that I, I think I needed is getting to change it up all the time and getting to, to travel as well. You know, I, I worked in, I worked in Montreal for three months this year in the winter, and Ooh. that was the coldest place I have ever been. And it was like it was like an expedition. We were shooting a Christmas movie, so it was good because it was supposed to be the North Pole. But the average was negative eleven the first week I was there. Holy which is cow! The average, right? So <laughs> yeah. So, but but like you know, experiences like that. It feels like it feels like you're on an expedition with a bunch of. Uh, travelers and adventurers and we're all like you know the cast and the crew trying to put it together it's it's, it's really fun that's awesome uh, yeah. I love that you're able to enjoy it and it's not just a task right like just making money. yeah well I'm lucky enough that I mean I say I'm lucky enough. I, I haven't been grinding and, and working like every day for the last three years I don't I'm not in the position where I need a break you know I'm like I'm hungry for that next job because I've had a little bit of time off now but I mean, I guess I, I say that, but I, I was working on a top secret project for the last couple of weeks that I, you know, I can't talk about either, but I'm really excited about that. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot, there's a lot of irons in the fire. There's a lot of things that, um, that could be a big, that my next big thing, or it might be something else, you know? So it's, it's just kind of constantly juggling those meetings or those opportunities and also being ready. You know, I get auditions constantly. I got to get those done and within a couple of days. So it's, a lot you know but um it's also um it's hard to describe exactly what the day-to-day -day is going to be like right which makes it more fun i think it's spontaneous most definitely absolutely adventure. yeah there's no monotony so i love yeah. that i love how you just dangled that in front of us too i have a secret project but i can't tell you so sorry i know i should have, <laughs> I know I should have said it like that yeah <laughs> i'm sure that's exciting whatever it is though yeah. uh and all this too i love how you're painting this picture of what life can be like with diabetes you know this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is just showing people it doesn't have to be the end of the fun or the adventure. Absolutely. And that is my number one message with, with this life, with diabetics. It's that diabe diabetes or not, you can live a fulfilling, exciting life. And, and, and I say that because I don't want anyone with diabetes to think that there's anything they can't do that another non-diabetic can. So um, and that's and that's kind of my main my main goal is to push that message out there, because when I was a kid, I don't know about you. It was kind of more like, you know, I'm talking to my endocrinologists and they're 
They're talking about my life expectancy going down and all these complications I'm going to have when I'm older. Mm -hmm. And it was all super grim and gloom. And I remember that as a kid and me and my sister really, you know, that really impacted us a lot. And I want to be kind of one of those people who goes out there and, and tries to accomplish, like succeed in, in those goals, but also have a great time doing it and have these adventures in life that, um, that, you know, that people dream of with, with, with hopes that uh, other diabetics will see that and want to do it themselves and, and not think that it can, that it will hold them back. Absolutely. I love that you're spreading that message to, I get on a lot of calls with parents and talked to somebody yesterday who was diagnosed a week ago and yeah. same message was given, you know, you're going to die early. You're going to get complications. You can't do anything fun. <laughs> it's like, what? Look around. The world has changed for type one diabetes. You know, it's, Absolutely. It's scary <laughs> it needs to be. <laughs> especially with the treatment options, especially with, with, with the things that are available to us now, we can do whatever we want. We can do anything. Absolutely. Well, this kind of introduces another question too. Uh, and we can kind of wrap up with this one maybe, but uh, a couple of years ago, we ran a virtual summit and I asked everybody the same question. I said, if you could travel back in time to when you were first diagnosed, what would you either coach yourself on or encourage yourself with that maybe you weren't told or taught at that point? And I'd love to hear your perspective on that. You know, it has to be, it has to be um, attached to this message for sure. I mean, the three main messages that I always promote, I've already said two of them. Um, one of them, the first most important one is to live your life and do the, do the things that you want to do and do not let diabetes hold you back. Number one. Number two, uh, be familiar with all of the um, technology out there. Be familiar. Understand what's out there. We've got inhalable insulin now. That's something that I didn't think was going to be a thing. And it right. is extremely effective. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got that. We've got new uh, also procedures down the line. Talking to like the president of the JDRF, he's got some really exciting things that, that are coming down the line, as well as the cure. So that's that's all hopefully on its way and, uh, and exciting. But But even though the cure is not, it's important to understand the technology available to you. That's my second message. And my third message is bring the community together. I want people who have diabetes to talk openly about it. People who are in the limelight, professional athletes, um, actors, musicians. I want them, if you're a diabetic, I, I want them to be able to talk openly about it, not be embarrassed about their devices, not be embarrassed about, you know, being low in public, whatever it is. Uh, I want that messaging to be straight. And I want everybody to kind of feel like there's a, there's people talking openly amongst each other, feel like there's a community, feel like there's people out there that are dealing with the same thing you're dealing with because I didn't feel that when I was a kid. So those are, those are the three messages I would tell young me or any other diabetic out there. I love that. Yeah, I think it's such a, a message that needs to be like ingrained on the, the entrance to the hospital as you're getting diagnosed. Like people just need to know there is a positive. You know, it's not all doom and gloom, like you mentioned. And I just wish there were a way to get to everyone the day they were diagnosed, you know, correct yeah. the, the negative. I do too. Well, there's, you know, there's something I'm working on also um, as far as diabetes stuff. I, it's early still, but I'm working on a documentary that, um, that both is for the people who were just recently diagnosed. It explains diabetes to them in, in terms that hopefully they can understand, but also shows, uh, documents individual diabetics who are out there doing incredible things with their lives mm. so that it's 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 early still but um i think that it's going to be something big and it's it's still probably about a year away that's amazing though yeah i mean it's the kind of message we're talking about it's this message that i think diabetics need or i mean maybe they don't need but people who are newly diagnosed people who don't have the community people who don't understand it as much it's i think it's going to be a helpful tool for them Oh, absolutely. I mean, for the first eight years, I didn't know there was a community. <laughs> I thought it was just right. me and my and that, sister and, and, and some and random now that you do, though, isn't it so much more helpful that, that you know that these people are dealing with the same problems and there's other people out there giving tips that might help you, but also talking about it openly? Absolutely. Yeah, knowing that there's education, but also there's other people struggling, that I'm not the only one that's failing, right? That was a huge piece for me. But I wouldn't say fail. Fail is not the right word because you're still alive. You haven't failed yet. Very true. <laughs> you know, like you're not failing. Yeah. You're you're wor working through challenges, maybe. But I mean, we're still every day you have a bad diabetes day. There's always tomorrow. Yep. Important distinction. I love that. Yeah. Well, uh, tell me more about your story. I don't know how long. Uh, I mean, how old were you when you were diagnosed? What's what's family life like for you? 
Diagnosed at 19, I was in college, okay. collegiate athlete. Uh, so I think that covered it up for a while. I was living with it for a few months without knowing. What were you playing? Uh, I was a rower, so crew. Sure. Not sure. many people know what that is, especially on the West Coast. But okay. yeah, it's uh, it was a shock. A couple years later, my little sister got it. And yeah. my family is all medical professionals, so they kind of knew something was up. And another reason I wanted to get diagnosed. And uh, yeah, it was... Uh, I ignored it. I'll say it. I'll leave it at that. Where I didn't take care of my diabetes for a while. I okay. wanted to pretend that I didn't have any weaknesses. Well, you know, you know what? I think a lot of people deal with those same feelings because I had a, I had a time in my life when I ignored it too, even though I was diabetic for ten years. And then once I got to that point where I was on my own, I was in college. I didn't want to take care of myself the way I knew I should have. And you know, I I feel like I I'm a better person because of it now. Getting through it on the other side. And I feel like it's a similar something that you went through as well. Absolutely. And actually, I'd love to hear your thoughts on a positive that came from diabetes that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, for me, it's it's like a mission. You know, it's like when when I when I got this platform, when I when I started being successful in this business, I actually had a mission to for, for that platform that I have whatever the following I had. I had something to talk about. I had something, a message to send people. That was, that's something that um, even though, you know, I, I, I'm diabetic, I, I wouldn't change it because it, it's, it's brought this community together. It's been something that I feel like I've really been able to make an impact on, honestly. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of it because it's, um, it's one of my main driving forces, you know, to, to talk openly about it. I, I got to go to the JDRF Children's Congress a couple of years ago and talk to the Senate about the Special Diabetes Act and then passing it so that they could pass, so that they could develop more, uh, devices like the Dexcom. The Dexcom was developed because of the Special Diabetes Act and the funding from con or for con from Congress and the Senate. So getting to go there and be with like Victor Garber and yeah. and be amongst all these Type One kids and talk openly about them about you know some of the struggles I went through. Those are the kind of moments that it's all about. That that's that that's I want more of that. Uh, getting you know feeling like I'm making an impact and at the same time being around those those you know youth with type 1 diabetes absolutely okay yeah. so with this new project that you've got going on uh, and you know you don't have to share whatever is still secret about it but uh how do you think people will fi find this beneficial in the, the long term is it at diagnosis that they'll find it most beneficial is it uh when they're experiencing burnout 10 20 years later where mm -hmm. is the, the biggest impact yeah i, I think I think it's the ag diagnosis probably the biggest impact because it's um it's kind of it, it it's it's not done obviously but it's uh it's it's explaining it's explaining type one it's explaining what your body's goes goes through when you get low and how you feel but it's also seeing those those people who are are striving and in, in in making uh making the most out of their lives and doing extreme sports or incredible you know incredible things. Um, I, I think to answer your question, I think it's probably going to be most beneficial for those who are recently diagnosed, but it's for everyone. This, this is a documentary that I want anyone to be able to watch and, and to um, be inspired by these people on it, for sure. Yeah, it's awesome. And actually, as you're talking about that, it kind of brought up a new thought. Uh, I've been curious about in the, the realm of Hollywood, is there mm -hmm. this unspoken or spoken kind of collaboration or connection between type one diabetics who are in the limelight? You know what? That's a good question because um, I, I try, I'm, I'm open about it. If you're a type one diabetic and you're spreading awareness and you've got a fo following or you're, you know, doing any of that, I'll follow you. I want to be a part of it. I want to bring us all in together. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think there is. I, I feel like type one diabetics who are actors, there's an instant connection. So we all have something to talk about. Like I mentioned, Breck in uh, Austin Basis is another friend of mine who's a type one diabetic. Um, yeah, it, it feels like there's a real community. But also, I recently worked on an independent film called um, Quarter. And um, the creator and writer of it. Her name is a diabetic named Kelsey. And she asked me to come in and, and do a scene in it. I said, of course, because the whole film is kind of documenting what her life is like going through dating and going through, you know, growing up as a type one diabetic. And I thought it had a lot of really, really um, great messaging and great messages inside the film. So that's something that I'm looking forward to promoting as well. 
Oh, wow. That's so yeah, cool. So she, she's, she's a type one diabetic who, you know, who's, who's a writer and wanted to make it happen and asked me. And I said, of course, I'd love to help. That's fantastic. Well, yeah. Yeah, let us know when that comes out. I would love to, to spread the word as well. Definitely. I think it's going to be a, a really, um, it's going to be a cute film. It's, I, I was very impressed with, with the work that she was doing. And um, it's, it's all do it's documenting what life's like as a, as a young diabetic, mid twenties diabetic. It's cool. Wow. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of fun stuff going on as the, uh, the awareness is increasing. I think a lot more people are familiar with uh, the type one diabetes, but the devices as well. Yeah, especially yeah. as we and see that, that's, diabetics starting to wear the CGMs too. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of weird, I think, but I, whatever, if, if it makes you more healthy. Yeah, I would say the, it's, the it's, one, it's, all, it's all more data, I guess. Yeah, the one hiccup is now I can't just assume it's a best friend that has type one when I see a stranger on the street wearing a CGM. Like, are you a health uh, influencer? <laughs> or do oh, you yeah, have yeah. type one? <laughs> that's, that's a question that didn't used to exist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I actually have a question for you too. Another thing that we haven't talked as yeah. much about is um, your, your family life and, and your wife and her feelings about you and your diabetes and your management. Is she, is she connected to your Dexcom? Great question. She does follow me, um, mm -hmm. which is a pro and a con because I can say, oh, I'm dropping. And she's like, mm, you're at 90. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> or, or it's the middle of the night waking everybody up. Sure. And we just had a baby uh, 11 and a half months ago. And so the alerts are a lot more of a threat now. Like if I'm going low, she's like, I'm so sorry, but please take care of that elsewhere. You know, don't make the baby up. Uh, uh, but she's very supportive. Uh, she always has been. I, I mm -hmm. tell her that that's one of the biggest things that I'm grateful for is to have a mm -hmm. supportive spouse with type one. Uh, and I can only imagine how painful it must be to have a spouse for those out there that don't have a supportive relationship where it's like oh turn that thing off you're fine you know and absolutely and that, that's why that, that's why i asked you the question because i i think it is vital for us as type 1 diabetics to have a partner who is um you know un both understanding and familiar with diabetes you know and i um i recently got married a couple of weeks ago to my wife and yeah congrats like, on that thank you so much yeah but it sounds like we, we have a very similar type of relationship and it's um, you know, for your, the people watching your podcast, I think it's really important. I know that young diabetics out there, the whole thing's embarrassing around your, your, you know, your devices or dating can be hard, whatever it is, yeah. you, you know, you get low on your, on your first date and you start mumbling, whatever it is, um, you will find somebody who is the perfect person to help you with your diabetes out there. And I want everyone to know that because, um, even if you're embarrassed of it, even if you're, you're with a partner who might not be very, uh, very helpful, there's people out there who are, and it is vital for us to have them, I would say, because I, I don't know what I would do without Lisa, my wife as well, um, helping me through those tough times. And I, uh, you know, I, I want type one. I, I know that one of the main uh, dilemmas or the, the main um, problems in young diabetics minds is that they're not going to find somebody who's going to be able to like handle diabetes. I'm telling you, you will. Absolutely. You'll find that person. I don't know if I missed this initially, but your wife's name is Lisa as well. Yes, she is. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Funny, okay. right? Yeah. So I mean, as just kind of piggyback off what you said, yes, I didn't know if I was going to find someone that was cool with my diabetes. And I found out years later that uh, when I was going to propose that my wife's father, so my father-in-law told her, uh, hey, this is a, a serious thing. It's lifelong. Are you sure you want to marry someone who has an autoimmune disease like that? And you know, she, without missing a beat, yes, absolutely. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but she has an autoimmune disease as well. So she has Crohn's. Uh, and so for both of us, it was like we had to make that uh, agreement with ourselves. Like we're going to support you whether this goes well or not. Right. Yeah. But yeah, there's always someone out there, someone that will support you, love you through the hard times and uh, not to settle. That's such a great message. I love that. Absolutely. And I think it's important for, for your viewers that if you're, if you're with somebody or you're worried, you won't find somebody who accepts your diabetes, you will. They're out there and they're more helpful than you can even imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. My wife uh, carb counts for me when she cooks dinners. It's, it's so it. fun to have that support. It uh, is. I've got a friend that carries a bag of gummies to this day. He's known me since high school. He's like, oh, just in case you have a well. You know, I like yeah. those it's good to have friends like that. out there. Yeah. yeah. Do you have that kind of support with friendship or is it mostly your wife that's the supportive one? Absolutely. I mean, I don't have time for friends who, you know, don't take my diabetes seriously, I guess. You know what I mean? It's like it's, it's something that I've got to deal with. I can't help it. Sometimes we got to take five minutes so I can eat a bag of gummies. That's just how it is. And if you can't 
be okay with that, then I don't have time for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does diabetes ever come up in conversation with your marriage? Um, what do you mean by that? Um, if there are maybe healthier options or easier options for diabetes, if you look at your Dexcom, let's say eight units, double arrows down, are you going, Hey, can we postpone leaving the house for five minutes? Like grab a juice box. Or is it like, I'm going to just deal with it. And she's kind of in a separate lane. Oh no. She, she's always aware if I'm double arrows down, like okay. she, you know, she's, she's got more alerts on her, uh, Dexcom follow app than I think I have. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, I, thanks for reframing the question. If, mm -hmm. the, if I'm low and we have something we got to handle, we are handling it together. I say, Hey babe, oh, wow. I'm low. What do we do? You know? And she, she's either, she goes and buys me, you know, a, a cupcake or we grab something here or whatever it is, we are in it together every time, especially if the circumstances are, are harder to handle. Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, so, I mean, if we're, you know, we're out somewhere, a lot of times, you know, we, sometimes I won't have anything on me and she'll have something in her purse. And if she doesn't, she's going straight to the bar and buy me a lemonade. You know, it's just kind of our, our system. I love that. Does she travel with you when you're out on set in different countries? It, it depends. Um, she didn't make it to Montreal, luckily, because it was just too cold. Um, but she she has about half the times when I'm going out of the out of the state, she does. Um, so I mean, I we don't ever go more than a few weeks separated, but she does have my follow up. So in the middle of the night, oh, you sure. know, I might be on set and like working through a low, and she gets the alert, and she's always calling me, making sure I'm okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, I used to get calls like that in different countries, and she's like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like. I'm okay. Thank you so much for checking in on me. So, so, yeah. so that's not your wife though on your follow up. Who you got? You had friends or something? Your parents? Oh, it is my wife. Yes, yeah, so right. Okay. Follow up. Yeah, my got sister it. is as well. But that's it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. And your sister, you said was a type one as well, right? She is. So it's type one, and she has the other side of the the equation as a nurse, and she's studying to get her CDE right now. So amazing. She's trying to to help people in that respect, and it's really cool because she's uh doing a lot of good. I love that. That. Yeah. And I love that you got that knowledge, the, the drive to help others like that. And then you took the drive into a new career path. So you're still helping, you're still inspiring, giving people hope, which is so crucial. Uh, but you're doing so in a different path that allows a whole new world of people to see what type one is that wouldn't have seen it otherwise. It's amazing to see that crossover that you've done. Thank you. I've been very lucky. Like, like I said, um, diabetes was always kind of uh, in the forefront of my mind, what I wanted to kind of build my career with. And I found a way to kind of do it a different way. I'm really happy about that. That's amazing. Well, shoot, we've, I've covered a, a ton of great topics today, but I want to give you a chance to either share any golden nuggets that you've had with your diabetes or uh, any other messages that you'd like to share. Mm -hmm. I mean, put me on the spot. I feel like you've asked me for my golden nuggets a couple of times and now I'm running out of them. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, like, like I keep saying, those three messages are so important. Uh, build a community and be a part of it. Understand the technology that's available for you to, to treat your diabetes. And above all, don't let it hold you back, no matter what. Just live your life and you can accomplish all of your goals. You just have to be a little more responsible sometimes. Love that. Absolutely. Well, while we're uh, on the topic of you creating all these different pieces of awareness and inspiration, I know some people can just Google your name and they'll find tons of resources, but where is the best place for people to either find you or find the projects you're working on and connect in that respect? It's definitely my Instagram. Uh, I've got, I think I've got Twitter and TikTok, but it all goes through my Instagram. So it's just at Derek Thieler. And um, that's how I kind of keep everyone updated with what's new with me. Um, yeah, that's where you can find my inform information. Fantastic. All right, everybody, not that he needs more followers, but go follow Derek Thaler. He's amazing. He does put up a lot of fun content. I see the Dexcom updates and everything. And uh, yeah, it's really, really excited about that project you've got coming up as well. Yeah, I will keep you updated too, for sure. I'll, I'll definitely let you know how it's going. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Derek. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and connecting and uh, best of luck with all these projects and helping people around the world. Thank you, thank you so time. much, Matt. And thank you so much for what you do. I'm so happy to be here, be a part of your podcast. And, um, and I, I try to make myself available too. If anyone has specific questions about 
my life or Dexcom or being, you know, being a diabetic actor, I try to answer all of the ones that I see. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to trying to be available as well. And um, I thought the conversation went great. Happy to be here. And he's such a good guy. Wow. Still replying to people. I love it. Well, yeah, thank you, Derek. You really are an incredible individual. And I know a lot of people see that in you. So thank you for hanging out. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this one. We'll catch you in next week's episode. See you later. Keep up the fight. Wow. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, I certainly enjoyed talking with Derek and uh, really, really impressed by all the work he's doing in the diabetes space. And uh, of course, for this incredible documentary coming out soon. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. If you have not yet, definitely go follow Derek. He's got a lot of great stuff that he shares, talks about diabetes and uh, fun to see what he's been up to. In addition to that, if you are somebody who's looking for support, seeing that it is National Diabetes Awareness Month. So a lot of different places you can go. On Instagram, there's a ton of accounts just like ours where you can find information, support, or even just somebody else living with the disease so you don't have to feel quite as alone. So as Derek mentioned, you can go follow him. We've got our Instagram account at FTF Warrior. But if you're looking for more of a informational space, trying to learn the new strategies to navigate life and follow your dreams without blood sugars getting in the way, I invite you to go check out Diabetes in Action com. This is a private training we did not too long ago on a new method of diabetes management that I guarantee is going to help you move the needle forward and make some progress with more stable blood sugars. All right, so go check that out, diabetesinaction.com. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next episode next week. Have a great day, and keep up the fight.